because I refuse to not be first. Do we do enough? Well, I never shut up, Harry. Uh, it must have been about 17, 16, 17. We nicked their guilt rings. Right, the bouncer's guilt rings. This is no good for me. That's the reality. If you want the honest truth, and I see it every day. Hello and welcome to Raw, the Fight Within podcast with me, Coogan Cassius. This week I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Miss GB. Can I still call you that? Yeah, call me whatever you have been called, Wes. Natasha Jonas. How are you? I'm good. good. Yeah, in Liverpool. Um, doesn't seem to be loads of fights happening in Liverpool over the last however many years. There's been the odd one here and there, but this is always a city where it was always known for its fight nights quite regularly. But yeah, I think it's um, you know past part of our heritage. Of the two biggest sports in Liverpool, I would say, is football and boxing, and we're divided on many things. But boxing would unite today. Absolutely, right. I'm going to start you off quite easy into this, and then uh, we'll see how we go on. <laughs> what for you as a kid? What was your kind of first ever early memories of boxing, just in general? Um. My very, very first memories is me. I've got two older boy cousins who, who are the ones that like, they love sport and they was always playing footy and whatever. And so I did everything they did and I was, I was allowed out, but as long as I was with them. So my first ever memory of boxing is that we always wanted to fight when I was like, stop fighting, stop fighting, stop fighting. So we invented, we always just didn't invent things because we didn't have the money to buy it. We invented a way of making a gum shield so we used to get my nan's like Kleenex that she, you know, the tissues that you'd put in them things, and we'd fold it up into a way, put it under the um, water, so obviously it was soggy tissue, put it in our mouths so it would mould to our mouth and put it in the freezer. Okay. And then after an hour we'd come back, put it in, it'd be a gum shield, we'd punch each other. So that's, that's my earliest memory. Um, did, did that idea ever take off of how to make a gum shield? No, um, but I did do it in a Everlast advert once. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, only on a little TikTok thing. Oh. As a as a childhood memory of boxing, so yeah, that was my first. But you know, fight nights watching me dad with my dad watching with my dad. That's probably like me of professional boxing. That was my first ever memories, and it was like a thing to do. I was allowed to stay up late, and yeah, I was allowed because it was all it was mostly in America at that time. Mm. Um, so I was allowed to stay up late and watch the boxing with my dad. So. Do you remember the first ever fight you went to? Oh God, it was, it could have been a Nigel Ben one, you know. Um, I was a little bit too young at the time to appreciate it. And I sat on my dad's meet knee, asking him to tell me stories like, most of the time. Um, but I had a fond memory of that whole, of that whole uh, night because he was telling me the stories. But I think it was a Nigel Ben one. And after that we went back and I was a bit older and I, like watched the actual fight and that was uh Mikey Mikey oh, what's his name? Little Mikey from Manchester. Gomez. No. Um oh, why can't I think of his name? I was mates with him for years. Oh that's gonna annoy me. You Phantom. Can't... Oh it might have been like that. Mikey Oh that's gonna annoy me. If it comes back to you okay, just okay. bring it back. Um, for yourself, like whether you're a fan or obviously you're heavily involved in the sport, but do you have someone that kind of inspired you into even watching boxing back when you was a kid? Everyone's always got one person that kind of maybe, if for, for me as a fan, I've always said it's Prince Nassim Hamid that got me even started watching boxing, but for yourself, was there someone that... I never wanted to be a boxer, me, so it was just like... It was just a thing to do, and I love watching sports. I watch any sport, so at, at first it was just a thing to do with my dad, and that's how like it was. So I'd probably testament it to my dad. But if you're coming down talking about boxers, actual boxers, then probably Mike Tyson. I remember his first Holyfield fight, which is the like yeah. I remember where I was. I was sitting in the living room. I remember I kept on mad enough, and you know, waking up with my dad saying, oh, the, the, it's on, it's on, it's on." So yeah, it was probably Tyson. Because in terms of kind of women's boxing, obviously when you're asking men about who inspired them and normally it is a male that's coming back from the male answers, 
but you're in a peak period of boxing and you've been involved in that from the start. Over the last few years, obviously there was women's boxing prior to whatever year. But um, yeah, I think young girls now, I suppose if you ask them who got them into boxing, they could mention you, they could mention Katie Taylor or the the crop of uh, very good women fighters that we have now. But I suppose, yeah, Mike Tyson's uh, one that's very common amongst uh, everyone yeah. who loves boxing. Like, you come, when you're talking about big fights, I think there was my first ever one was the, like the Tyson and Holyfield, but there was also the Eubank, Ben and Collins era, which, as a as a Brit, they were that like they got me invested. So uh, I mean the big fights and the, the obviously the heavyweights and Tyson and Holyfield are two massive names. It was a massive occasion. So that was the fight that I remember. I say I'd say like that one fight. But when you're talking about like how much it meant to us and like. With the Ben and Eubank, like you just had to choose a side. You could no one ever in that time sat in the, on the fence. You you either chose that one or you chose that one, and they didn't like you know there was a lot of heated discussion. There was no like social media or anything in them days, but like the fans were quite staunch on each side. You know what I mean? So like as a Brit, I was I was I was um, I was fully Ben. I, I actually I cried. I remember, I remember crying and literally shed tears when he retired. Um, and I hated Chris Eubank for years. Do you ever think about if you hadn't got into boxing, where you'd be and what you'd be doing today? God only knows. God only knows. I think I would like to think if it wouldn't have been boxing, it would have been another sport. Because, like I said, I never intended to start from, from boxing. I was I was football through and through um, and that didn't work out and I was lucky enough to pick up boxing and, and turn out half decent at that. So I'd like to think that if it wasn't boxing, it, it would only be something else. Do you think it could have been football? You said that it didn't quite work out for you, but do you think that if boxing kind of hadn't come your way when it did, that part of you could have then pushed that side of football more? Yeah, well, at the time, the injury that I had meant it was the end of my football career and I was two years out of, out of playing and, you know, two years in any sport at a high level is, is a long time and, you, you know, it's, if I look at football now and my little sister and I think I'd never get in a team now, ever, not even close, but at the time, you're talking, you know, Yankee times, that, that I, was, I was, you know, I was decent. <laughs> Do you remember as a kid any kind of uh, away from boxing, any kind of serious argument or altercation that you ever got into away from any kind of boxing situation? Honestly. Honestly. All the time. Yeah. What do you, one that sticks oh in your God. mind? First time, school, over. I think it was arguing with a boy who was older than me for me older boy cousin, um, and yeah. I ended up on the wall for the week, let's just say. On the wall? On the wall, yeah. We used to have to stand on the wall for break, break times instead of being able to play out. Well, on top of a wall? No, you know, you had to stand, like, facing the wall. Oh, facing the wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we had that. Yeah, yeah, so you weren't allowed to play out and your punishment was standing facing the wall. Um, that was in school. Um, yeah, that was one of the first times, I think. Could you fight back then? Like. I mean... I've grew up with two older lads, like, you had to be able to fight. I was the young little girl that was, you know, you know, I couldn't always let the lads win and I was trying to prove myself, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I knew how to handle myself. I wasn't scared. No. Yeah, I'll believe you anyway. <laughs> um, do, do you remember a time in your life where you felt as though you were fighting a losing battle, wherever that was or whenever that was? Oh, I think that's life, isn't it? At, at, at any given stage, whether that's you know, I don't know, academically, um, whether that's like socially, or whether that's like within your family or whatever. Sometimes it feels like you're just put on the wall, and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, it's just not getting you anywhere. But if you're asking for specific examples. I'd, I'd probably probably go with school. 
um, especially senior school when I moved out to Liverpool and, and went over the water. Um, I, f I found I've always struggled with school. I wasn't very good academically wise, and I, I felt like where we'd moved to was a bit more affluent than where we grew, where I grew up in Liverpool, and I was one of only three, I think, black people in the school, and it was the first time that had even crossed my mind that like I was different to everybody. It was the first time. I went to an all-girls school, which was just an absolute nightmare for me because I'd always got on better with boys. I liked the things that boys did. It wasn't kind of the, the thing to do, to be sporty as a girl back when I was young. So I struggled with that. Um, and then, I, like I say, academics-wise, I just struggled with things and, you know, they it felt like everybody else knew how to do the work and I couldn't and it was just an uphill struggle from there. Like, everything that my mum didn't want me to do, which was mess around and, you know, she wanted me to move me out of that area to get a better education and to, you know, think better and do better and be better. But at the time, I was like, I can't do it. So I, I didn't even try. What was you good at at school? Like, academically? Sports. Sports. Yeah, what it. about anything else aside from sports for you? Nothing. Literally nothing. I wasn't, like, I wasn't good at maths. I was, I was, I was OK at English. That was, that was just like, my saving grace was English. I wasn't always able to um, like express like this, how I, how I felt or whatever, but I could write it down really well. Um, so English was probably the only thing. And, and, and with English, I think it's more of a case that as long as you can argue why you're right, you can't be wrong. So if you feel a certain way when you read a poem or whatever, or you know you're reading Shakespeare and you can recite why you felt you felt like this or what you think that it means to you, as long as you can explain why you why it's right, right why you think that you're right. It's not like maths where it's like what's three plus three. The only answer yes, is six. Yeah, you know what I mean? So the English, I was able to express myself better. Were your parents always alright with your boxing career even when you first started? Were they on board with it? Um, I think we. If I would have said to my mum, and I think she said this before, if I had gone and said, right, mum, I think I want to be a dancer, she'd have been more shocked at that than I want to be a boxer, like I said. I've, you know, I've always done, like, footy and uh, kickboxing, tie boxing, karate. So it's not unusual for, for me. She was... Yeah, I think she was. I think she was. Do you think you'll get that with your girl? She's got no interest in boxing at all. Really? Not at all. Like, she... She'll come and say she'll know in the the kids like soft play areas when things are swinging. She'll be like, "Mom, look at this!" She lives a little combo, and then she should like get off. But she's got no interest at all. Are you happy about that? Or? Um, I mean, I would love love for her not to have to diet and like <laughs> do all that stuff because I know, you know, I know what being hungry is, and I know I, I think for you to go into a sport that your your, your parents done. And, and being quite successful at, then it would be it's hard for you because you've got to live up to that and be better. Comparisons. Yeah, it's always yeah. going to happen. So I think that's hard. But when I if, if I take that like myself out of the equation and I think like all the opportunities and everything that I've got and it's brought me, I'd be stupid to deny her of that if she wanted to, because mm. you know. Well, we're seeing a lot of these situations with. Uh, People like you talk about Nigel being there with Connor Connor. and Chris with Junior and there's Ricky with with Campbell. Campbell. Yeah, exactly. It's just yeah, but I suppose Brody, Michael Brody, Michael Brody. Yeah, okay. yeah Michael Brody. I knew it'd come to you at some point. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, it, if you listen to the first three minutes of this, <laughs> you'll know exactly what Tasha was going on about there. But um, for yourself though, today, like away from boxing, you're kind of in the peak of your career, should we say? Is that fair to say? It, it, yeah, it's fair, but it's mad to think that I, I'm literally at the end's door. Um, and it's been a long career, and to think I'm picking now is, is mad. It's wild. What are the everyday battles for you, though, away from boxing in your life? When you get up in the morning, what are the, whether they're mental or physical, what are, whatever they are, what are the everyday battles for Tasha Jonas? When I... When you're deciding, well, when I was deciding to go pro, it was the struggle of time. And I didn't feel like I was getting enough time with the baby. And, and to be honest, I still don't feel I get enough time with the baby. But 
I, it was only when I listened to other working mums, like obviously my group of mates are, are girls, and when I listened to them saying, oh, you know, they're in the same boat. So, like, people, working mums are, are in the same boat. You, there's certain things that are expected of you. You know, my nan is a brilliant mum, and she raised ten of her own, and, you know, she's a mum's mum. Like, she, you know, a stay-at-home mum, and she cooked and cleaned, and, she, you know, if I go to my nan with any stain, she can get it off, you know, give her the worst ingredients and she can make a meal of it. Mm. Um, so that's what I was brought up around, my mum, similar. Um, but then with me, with me, I didn't feel like that was my role. <laughs> um, and I struggled with, with that and I struggled with the baby and, you know, I was picking, I was dropping her off at like, I think, half seven, eight o'clock and I wouldn't be picking her up till five o'clock. And then I had, you know, two hours to have fun with her get her to bed, get her washed, you know, be there and, and do them things. And it was like, it was just, it was always, we were always rushing. And like, yeah, so like, it was, that, that's tough. And I think as a new mum, like I said, there's so many expectations of what you should be, what you should do and so much information you're trying to take on of, you know, what your nan says, what your mum says, what the, the nurse says, you know, what the hospital says and what the doctor says and, you know, what women's group says and what, you know, it was, it was a lot of information to take in and I, and I felt overwhelmed. Um, but, yeah, you just, you just find your own way eventually. And, yeah, it was tough. It was tough at first. Do you feel like you've missed time, though, and missed moments, etc., or not really? With her and, yeah. and just in general, I think that's, that's the sacrifice of being a a sports person and, and an athlete um, and it, it, some of the things that I've missed out of I, I think are really bad like I was a chief bridesmaid for my cousin's wedding and I couldn't go because I was boxing um, you know like I say time with the baby all the time and you know just big family occasions and events whether that's a funeral whether that's a wedding whether that's whatever it is and I haven't been a part of and you know I, I do you get FOMO sometimes? And, you know, I remember going to the Olympics and all my mates were going to Ibiza and I was absolutely fuming about it. And I was like, make sure like you throw me every day. <laughs> and they were like, how are you jealous of us going to Ibiza and you go to the Olympics? But it, it's just, you know, it's, you, you are still a normal person. You've just got, your priorities are just a little bit different. So that's the difference, isn't it, between where you're at now and what you've been doing in your life with your boxing career that separates you from maybe some other people because, like you said, seven years ago you was a, <coughs> a brand new mum and all these things that you are missing out in your life because you've dedicated that time to, to doing that. And if you don't do that, then you may not be where you are now. Yeah, I think people call it selfish, but... It, it is all about self, it is about you. And, you know, a world champion, mom, and, you know, whatever else, other titles, Miss GB, they're all title, all the titles that people give me, but that's not who I am at my core. Um, and who, I, I've got to be true to myself. I've got things that I want to achieve despite of, like, all of these titles that I am. So I've got to be, I've got to, you know, lay on my deathbed and think, right, I'll let, I've done what I want to do and be at peace with myself or I've got to leave the sport feeling like that. Um, so you have got to be selfish, but then it is about you. So selfish is not always a negative thing. It's, it's about you. It is about self. So. I don't know as a person how, whether you are an emotional person, if you call yourself an emotional person, when was the last time you were having to fight back tears? Um... Probably um, after the Terry, <clears throat> after the Terry Arthur fight, I'm not really an emotional person if I'm honest. But there's two times within the sport I've cried, and one was when I came back from the Terry Arthur fight, and the baby was like. Mummy, mummy, did you win? And I was like, no, babe, but I didn't lose. And she was like, because I had sunglasses on, obviously, because my eye was cut and it had swollen and dropped by that time. 
She was like, can I see your eye? So I lifted my glasses up and obviously my eyes are half shut. It was this one, I think. So half shut. And um, she just gave me a kiss and said, oh, you know, you're my champion, mummy. And I was just like, thanks, babe. Um, and the other time was losing to Katie Taylor in the Olympics. I literally cried for a whole maybe 10 hours. And I phoned my mum and my dad at like seven, six, six o'clock in the morning. And I was like, where are you? Expect like I knew they wouldn't say bed. They're like, oh, just in the hotel. It's like a usual. They were like, yeah, we're up, we're up, we're up. I was like, mum, I need to get out of this. I need to get out of this Olympic village. She was like, no, come over. We'll, we'll come and get you. I was like, no, I'll come to you. Just tell me where it is and I'll come. And I, I, I went and I, I was half over it. And then like, I was still like a bit teary. And then I laid back down on the, the bed after literally crying for like 10 hours on the couch, sorry, in the Olympic Village. And then the highlights of that day came on and I was one of the highlights. I just felt a tear just trickle, like where I was laying like that, it just trickled down my face and hit my cheek and then started crying again. I just cried my eyes out again. Those two situations there, is that the only, you said you're not an emotional person, are those the only two situations that would kind of produce that kind of emotion outside of boxing? You said, you're, well, you said in general you're not an emotional person, but would it be only something that meant something like that? You made reference to the Harper draw and the, the Taylor loss. But outside of boxing, would you say that you're not that way? There's Obviously, there's times when I've cried. Um... But yeah, I, I wouldn't. My nan, there's, there's a joke between me and my nan that she says I've got a swing and brick. But I think, I think everyone in our family, there's so many of us, but we've all got roles to play. And I'm like the, you know, I'm the, the kind of logical one, the strict one, and the one who tells people off, that's my role. So I, I kind of hide my emotions to, to play that role. And I try not to get emotionally involved because I've got to do the telling off. So I keep a lot of my emotions to myself and then I go away and deal with them however that is. But to everybody else, they'll be like, oh, she's, you know, she's, she doesn't show any, she's heartless. And it's because I, I go away and process my emotions away from, away from sight. That works for you, obviously. Yeah, it works for me. Have you ever had to fight demons in your life? Are you still fighting any now? We're always fighting demons, I think. Um, yeah. Do you want me to tell you them? Of course right. I do. <laughs> um, I, 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 well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be the best person I can be. And, you know, there's always things that pop up, whether that's past or whatever, that, you know, I don't want to be that person. Um, and I'm not that person now, but it's took me to go through them things to realise that I don't want to be that person. Do I want to divulge them? Probably not. OK, fair enough. Are you content then now in what you're talking about in, at this part of your life? Yeah, I think it's took a lot of lessons and life experience to to, to you know, have them emotions and deal with them emotions and go through them emotions and, and come out better. Everything's not, like, when you talk to successful people, whether that's in, you know, business or sport or whatever, they're always telling you about the good bits. Everyone tells you about the good bits and everyone sees me with the belts and like, yes, you know, she's done it, she's, you know, smashed it, like, you know, she didn't have them a couple of years ago, now she's got them and that's the success that's not. There's so many, uh, it's 39 years of trauma Life is a reaction to trauma. You react in, in, and everyone reacts differently. And, you know, that's just got me where I am. Am I content? I'm happy with where I am right this second, but do I still want to keep progressing? Yeah, because you can't stand still. Life doesn't stand still. Sports doesn't stand still. So you've got to keep progressing. You've got to keep better. And you've got to keep expecting better of yourself. You can't, you know, just because you're a, a good person doesn't mean you can't do things better to be better or do better. I've always thought that consent is, I don't like that word consent mm. because 
that shows me if someone's content about something is that they're kind of happy to be where they are and not push forward. I know it's not like that in every situation of your life. Like, with my child, I'm content that I have one child. It's not a case of in that respect, but there are aspects of being content that doesn't show that you're willing to kind of better that situation, if that makes sense. No, oh, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. That's like, yeah, that's how I took it when you said that. Yeah. Like, I'm a content now because I still want to keep moving forward. Where does your fight spirit come from? I mean that in a mentally more so than kind of any physical sense. I think, you know, nature, nature, Liverpool, Toxter, Jonas, everything. Um, all them ingredients. All them ingredients and then, you know, just, yeah, trying, trying to be that person that everyone said that I couldn't be. Would you say that you've gone through any spate of depression in your life? Oh, I think there's been a few. I, don't, I, only, I only think I've recognised it. The, the, the biggest one um, was um, coming back from America. And obviously I had these high hopes of, you know, being Mia Hamm and being sponsored by Nike and playing professional football over there and it just didn't work out. And when I came home, I was one of the first people in my family to go to university. Everyone was made up by you. And I felt like I let everyone down. And I felt like I was watching people around me. And there was Wayne Rooney, 16, and, and you know, playing for Everton. And it was Beth Tweddle, just when I first came with God. She was, you know, 15, 16, 17, whatever she was. And I was thinking, wow, I'm 20. Like, uh, like uh, if I was going to be any type of sports person, I would be here already, and you know, when now looking back, it, that was just a horrible, dark time, where I, I was just, I went back, I was probably being a stereotypical, you know, I think I, I was living up to the stereotypes of what people said I was going to be, and that was always something that I, I, th I was promised myself I wouldn't do. I was in, I wouldn't say gangs, but we were getting involved in, in that type of activity. Um, I was going out and I was drinking a lot more than I should have, and I was getting sacked from jobs because I just weren't turning in. And it was just, but it was like an every weekend thing. And, and at one stage, it was just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It was one day. There was when, was it Tuesday? It was the one day that I never used to go out. And then Something started happening over the water on a Tuesday, and I just I had to go there, and it got to the point where I wouldn't even have to dress up to get in clubs because the bouncers knew who I was, and I was the regular, so they just let me in regardless of what I was wearing, um, and it was just, it was just yeah, it was just, just I was going nowhere, didn't have no motivation, didn't have no, just didn't know what I was going to do. What was the turning point for you? Turning point um, was me nan. Um, she got we got a grenade through through my nan's window in um, my nan's house where we was all living at the time, and it blew off my nan's leg and her finger, her wedding fin ring finger. And I think yeah, I was just yeah, that was just. Jesus. It was just hard to take because my me, me nan's like, literally, the she, one, she's the epicenter of the family, so we were like, we didn't know whether she was going to live or not because she was in a bad way. Um, but then it was just like, she wouldn't hurt a soul and that was the person that affected the most and that was probably one of my biggest fears. I always had a fear that I'd have a kid and she wouldn't know me nan and that, would, that was my worst fear. Um, so it was, yeah, that hurt. The biggest wake-up call you could have ever had? Yeah, the biggest. Obviously not. It's a horrendous situation, you just told us, uh, but for yourself, like, yeah, you couldn't have got a bigger wake-up call than that. Yeah, yeah, it was horrible. Um, and just to see her lying there and half lifeless and, yeah, it was hard. It was hard. You fight for your 
your child, your family, I know you've got a very close-knit family, who fights for you? Who's in your corner, regardless of what's going on, whatever situation it is, whether it's day or night, who's there for you? I think family, family and friends. Like, I've got a, actually a few um, like fans that I've met that I'm really close to now. Um, but yeah, my family and friends mainly, they, they, they're the ones that say all the bad stuff and you know, friends choose you. You don't, you know, your family, you can't choose, you're stuck with them regardless, but your friends choose you. And there's, you know, there's been situations, whatever they've been, where I know that I've literally got friends that would do anything for me. And I, I know with my family that regardless of whether I was Miss GB or not, would love me regardless, so. All those things you've gone through, like, how do you now, 39? Do you have to bring that up? 30, you already mentioned it. I'm 38. 30. 30. I'm 39 in June. 39 in June. But where you sit now, um, and obviously in regards to your career as well, because not that this podcast is about that, but we know I've been there when you've had them, as in been there watching when you've had those moments in your career, but from everything that's gone on in your life, whether it's boxing or outside things you've just told us, to sit here now, kind of where you are, there must be, I know you're not finished yet, we know you're not finished yet, but you must look at that and think, look at where I am now as well. I don't think you appreciate the journey until you, you know. Till it's done. Till it's done, till the time's done and over. It's the same with, you know, the Olympics. I, I literally, you can ask for A's, you can ask, you know, Caris or whoever, Caroline, how many times I messaged them throughout the Olympics and was like, enjoy the moment. Same with Fala and, you know, Joe Cordian who went to the last the ones before that. I was like, make sure you enjoy the moment. I know because you're so results driven when you're an athlete that it's hard to enjoy that moment. And it's only now it's been gone and you look back that I think, wow, that was that was something else. But I didn't feel like that when I was in it. Um, and the same, I, th I think the same with boxing. You know, I think the same with life. You know, some of the best things and, you know, most best quality of stuff you get is when people's on death's door and, you know, they tell you things and if, if you appreciate what the journey that they've been on. And I think, yeah, you've got to, you, I, I do try and live more in the now and, like, be thankful for it. Um, but, yeah, I... I, I try and live in the now and just appreciate everything that comes and whatever comes was meant for me and whatever doesn't wasn't. Final one here. What drives that fight within you? What is it? What is the main factors that push you and drive that fight within you? Push me. Me fighting against me. Say that again. Me fighting against me. Yeah. Just trying to be better, do better, be better. And I, I did used to look for you know, other people's appraisal of me. And you, you look to other people for like value, but I don't do that anymore. I value, I value myself. There's, there's a few people that I, I, I take on board what they say. You know, my mum, my nan, my cousins, my, some of my best mates, but I don't look for that kind of acceptance from others. I just. Just do what I want. It's the best way to be, isn't it? Well, it's led me here, so. Okay, Natasha, much appreciate you coming on Raw, The Fight Within. Um, like I said, I've, I don't know, I think our first time I interviewed you, I, I'm not, I think it was before you actually turned pro. Uh, I'm pretty certain it was. It I'm not 100% sure. It was at a show, it might have been Callum Smith. Because your press conference to announce your turning pro was here, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But... The, it was oh, downstairs. What's that? It was downstairs. It was, yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, the point I was making was, I think, like, a lot of this stuff that you were talking about, I didn't know. And I don't know... Uh, there'd be people, obviously, close to you that you've spoken about things um, there that I didn't have a clue about. So I do appreciate you sharing that on here. That's one. Okay, 
Thank you very much for listening. Make sure you comment, like, and subscribe, and we will catch you next week on Raw the Fight Within. Thank you very much. Refuse to not be first. Do we do enough? Well, I never shot up at it. And it must have been about 17, 16, 17. We nicked their guilt wins. Right, the bouncer's guilt wins. This is no good for me. That's the reality. If you want the honest truth, and I see it every day.